Yeah, man. Coronado. The Coronado Expeditions. Let's get back into it. We're talking about Esteban, Black Steven. Yeah, man. Estebanico. Back in the great book, The Journey of Coronado, 1540 to 1542. Translated and edited by George Parker Winship. Let's go. On page 37. Monday, February 23rd, 1530, the army was, which was to conquer the seven cities of Cibola, started on its northward march from Compostela. For 80 leagues, the march was along the much-used roads. Which followed the coast to Koliakon, Koliakon. Everyone was eager to reach the wonderful regions which were to be their destination, but it was impossible to make rapid progress. The cattle could not be hurried while the baggage, animals, and the carriers were so heavy laden with equipment and provisions that it was necessary to allow them to take their own time. Several days were lost at the Sintizpak River, across which the cattle had to be transported one at a time. At Kia Metla, there was another delay. Here the army camped in the remains of a village which Nuno de Guzma had established. The settlers had been traveled, had been driven away by the pestilence caught from the Indians and by the fierce onslaught of the natives who came down upon them from the surrounding mountains. So they was getting jammed up by Nagas. Just popping out the mountains on them. They're saying they caught a pestilence from the Indian. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let them tell it. They brought the pestilence on the Indians. On the Nagas. The food supply of Coronado's force was beginning to fail, and as the tribes here about were still in rebellion, it became necessary to send a force into the mountains to obtain provisions. The army master, Saman Yego, who had been warden of one of the royal fortresses, commanded the foraging party. The men found themselves buried in the thick underbrush as soon as they passed beyond the limits of the clearing. One of the soldiers inadvertently, but nonetheless, in disregard of strict orders, became separated from the main party, and the Indians, who were nowhere to be seen, at once attacked him. <laughs> in reply to his cries, the watchful commander hastened to his assistance, the Indians who had tried to seize him suddenly appeared or disappeared. They, or when everyone seemed to be safe, Samyango raised his visor. And as he did, so an arrow from among the bushes pierced his eye, passing through his skull. The death of Saman Niego was a severe loss to the expedition. The Nagas was on their ass, man. The Nagas was on their ass, man. On their tailbone. <laughs> they wanna act like they just dropped us off in slavery <laughs> from Africa. They came over here and they met the real Nagas, you know what I'm saying? Nagas just pushing them back, pushing them back, pushing them back. Don't let the victor tell the story. Like we was over here on some chump change, man. When we have time to become a slave, man. We've been fighting Shikamago Wars the whole time.
The death of Simon Yago was a severe loss to the expedition. Brave and skillful, he was beloved by all who were with him or under him. He was buried in the little chapel of a deserted village. The army postponed its departure long enough to capture several natives of the district whose bodies were left hanging on the trees in order to counteract the bad augury which followed from the loss of the first life. Knock his own tree. The army postponed its departure long enough to cap to capture several Nagas of the district. And what they do with them, they hung them on the trees. Sound like that crucifixion in the book of Acts, right? <laughs> hung on a tree. You've been getting hung on trees, man. You've been getting crucified. You've been getting sacrificed. That's why we're getting the Coronado Expedition. I love to Aqua Chef Condi for reading this the first time for Nagas years ago in the ether. And uh, I just had to pick it back up, man, and just, you know, really uh, surf this way. A much more serious presage was the arrival of Kia Metla as the army was preparing to leave of Melchior Diaz and Juan de Saldivar or Zaldivar, returning from their attempt to verify the stories told by Friar Marcos. Melchior Diaz went to New Galatia with Nuno de Guzman, and when Cabeza de Vaca appeared, in the province. In May 1536, Diaz was in command of the outpost of Culiacan. And while they call this stuff New Galatia, right here in America, and then they got their Galatians, Book of Galatians, Ephesians, all that stuff, man. Let you know they are duplicating. You, they duplicating the American story in real time. In real time, man. Eh? So Diaz was in command of the outpost of Culiacan. He was still at Culiacan in the autumn of 1539 when Mendoza directed him to take a mounted force and go into the country toward the north to see if the account which Friar Marcos brought back agreed with what he could observe. He left Culiacan November, November 17th with 15 horsemen and traveled as far north as the wilderness beyond which Cibola was situated. Again, Cibola, C-I-B-O-L-A, is what they also call in forbidden history, Shimbala. Cibola becomes Shimbala, or is Shimbala. Huh? Shimbala. <laughs> Shabala, right? This is India Superior, and they're looking for the cities of gold. They're trying to get on the Atlantis flow. They're trying to get on the Lemurian flow, the Mu flow. That's why you got the Tao and Esteban and the Hevelia. People of Hiva or Hawa. We've seen it clearly. That's why we had to get it like it's the first time. All right, so they're traveling there, going as far north as the wilderness beyond which Cibola was situated following much the same route as the friar had taken and questioning the Indians with great care. Many of the statements made by Friar Marcos were verified and some new facts were obtained, but nowhere could he find any foundation for the tales of the wealthy and attractive country except in the descriptions given by the Indian. So, you know, you had some other 
turncoat knockers that was giving him some descriptions on where to find the drop. You know, maybe they didn't give it all. You know, they they didn't give him all the drop. Maybe they uh, were just, you know, playing a part. But you know, this we don't know. But we know somebody helped these hijacks. You know what I'm saying? They were looking for the wealthy and attractive country, Cibola, Shimbala. The cold weather had begun to trouble his men seriously before he reached the limit of his explorations. He pushed on as far as Kikit Talakali, C-H-I-C-H-L-I-L-T-I-C-A-L-L-I. Kikitlitikali. <laughs> However, but here the snows and fierce winds from across the wilderness forced him to turn back. So even Mama was pushing him back. At Kila Metla, he encountered Coronado's force. He joined the army, sending his lieutenant, Sal Devar, with three other horsemen to carry his report to the Viceroy. This was delivered to Mendoza on March 20th and and is embodied in the letter to the king dated April 17, 1540. Now, none of this is play play. That's why we're digging on it. These are facts. Right? These are letters. These are dated. All this stuff. So we dig on this and you can bear this. We bring in this Esteban, this, this Azamore, right? Who they call child of the son. They had to get him to get the son to come out. <laughs> And they all looking for the city's gold. So this gives credence and validation. When you're watching this cartoon, Cities of Gold, and you're seeing Tao talking about all this ancient technologies and flying condors and all this stuff, man. If all this is true, what they bring it out, even in cartoon form, has some serious dropping. And if that has the drop and they came over here finding these ancient high-tech, high-tech weapons and all this, you know, masonry and all this stuff, right? So this lets you know you're in the old ancient world, man, with ancient technology and all this stuff. And our ancient technology looks like they futuristic stuff, man. That means they didn't come over here finding them Indians just dancing around teepees. They found knights. They found ancient high-tech knights, my knight. Dragons and knights and all that Merlin Camelot stuff. It's taking place right here. The impossible. All that Star Wars. <laughs> it's popping off right here. Hey. You got to think more high tech. These people low tech compared to you. You coming back online, man. You coming back to life. You need to know you are the highest technology. And possess the highest technology. It is your inheritance. It's your armor. Everything. We're coming back, though. Coronado did not allow Diaz to announce the results of the reconnaissance to the soldiers, but the rumor quickly spread that the visions inspired by Friar Marcos had not been substantiated. Fortunately, the friar was himself in the camp, although he was now the father provincial of the Franciscan order in New Spain. He had determined to accompany the expedition in order to carry the gospel to the savages whose salvation had been made possible by his heroic journey of the preceding spring. So, you, so we the savages and they're bringing us this excellent new tune. They want to change our ancient love song. They want to take us away from Hawa and bring us a JC, right? Now we got a hijack in between us and our Hawa. Because he want to carry the gospel to the savages. The mutterings of suspicion and discontent among the men grew rapidly louder. Friar Marcos felt obliged to extort, to exhort them in a special sermon to keep up a good courage. And by his eloquence, he succeeded in persuading them that all their labors would soon be well repaid. From Kiametla, the army resumed its march, procuring provisions from the Indians along the way. Mendoza stated 
1547 that he took every precaution to prevent any injury or injustice being done to the Indians at the time of Coronado's departure and that he stationed officials especially appointed for this purpose at convenient points on the road to Culiacan. We were ordered to procure the necessary provisions for the expedition. There was no means of telling how well this plan was carried into execution. A day or two before Easter, March 28, 1540, the army approached Culiacan. The journey had occupied a little over a month, but when Coronado from his lodging in the Cibola village of Granada, so the real Granada is right there in Cibola, we're talking New Mexico, Hawaku, Managa. Three months later, we called the slow and tedious marches, the continual waiting for the lazy cattle and the heavily loaded baggage trains and the repeated vexes, vexatious delays. We had hardly wondered, we can hardly wonder that it seemed to him to have been a period of four score days journey. The town of San Manuel that Culiacan in the spring of 1540 was one of the most prosperous in New Spain. Nuno de Guzman had founded the settlement some years before and had placed Melchior Diaz in charge of it. The appointment was a most admirable one. Diaz was not of gentle birth, but he had established his right to a position of considerable power and responsibility by virtue of much natural ability. He was a hard, hard worker and skillful organizer and leader. He inspired confidence in his companions and followers and always maintained the best of order and of diligence among those who were under his charge. Rarely does one meet with the man whose record for every position and every duty assigned to him shows such uniform and thorough efficiency. The settlement increased rapidly in size and in wealth and when Coronado's force encamped in the surrounding fields the citizens of the town insisted on entertaining in their own homes all of the gentlemen who were with the expedition. The granaries of the place were filled with the surplus from the bountiful harvest of two preceding years, which sufficed to feed the whole army for three or four weeks, besides providing supplies sufficient for more than two months when the expedition resumed its march. The comfortable quarters and the abundant entertainment detained the general and his soldiers for some weeks, this was the outpost of Spanish civilization, and Coronado made sure that his arrangements were as complete as possible, both for the army and for the administration of New Galatia during his absence. The soldiers, and especially the gentlemen among them, had started from Compostela with an abundant supply of luxuries, furnishings, and every equipment. Many of them were receiving their first rough lesson in the art of campaigning and the experiences along the way before reaching Culiacan had already changed many of their notions of comfort and ease. When the preparations for leaving Culiacan began, the citizens of the town received from their guests much of the clothing and other surplus baggage which was left behind in order that the expedition might advance more rapidly or that the animals might be loaded with provisions. Aside from what was given to the people of the place, much of the heavier camp equipage with some of the super, superfluous uh, property of the soldiers was put on board a ship, the San Gabriel, which was waiting in the harbor of Culiacan. An additional supply of corn and other provisions was also furnished for the vessel by the generous citizens. All this to look for you, right? All this to look for the gold in your backyard. A sea expedition to cooperate with the land force was a, power, a part of Mendoza's original plan. After the Viceroy left Coronado and probably while he was at Colima on his way down the coast from Compostela, he completed the arrangements by appointing Hernando de Alarcón, Alarcón, spelled A-L-A-R-C-O-N, his chamberlain, according to Bernal, 
Diaz. Let's get a little more of this drop, man. We just surfing the wave in the Coronado Expeditions. To command a fleet of two vessels, Ali Khan was instructed to sail northward following the coast as closely as possible. He was to keep near the army and communicate with it at every opportunity, transporting the heavy baggage and holding himself ready at all times to render any assistance which Coronado might desire. Al Arkan settled, sailed May 9th, 1540, probably from Acapulco. This port had been the seat of the shipbuilding operations of Cortez on the Pacific coast, and it's very probable that Al Arkan's two ships were the same as those which the Marquis claimed to have equipped for the projected expedition. Al Arkan sailed north to Santiago, where he was obliged to stop in order to refit his vessels and to replace some artillery and stores which had been thrown overboard from his companion ship during the storm. Thence he sailed to Agua or Hawa, Agua y Ahuale, as Ramusio has it, the port of San Miguel de Culiacan. The army had already departed, and so Alarcon, after replenishing his store of provisions, added the San Gabriel to his fleet and continued his voyage. He followed the shore closely and explored many harbors which the ships of the Marquis had failed to observe, as he notes, but he nowhere succeeded in obtaining any news of the army of Coronado. Melchior Diaz had met with so many difficulties in traveling through, his, through this country, which the army was about to enter on its march towards the seven cities, and the supply of food to be found there was everywhere so small that Coronado decided to divide his force for the portion of the journey, he selected 75 of the 80 horsemen, including his personal friends and 25 or 30 foot soldiers, which with these picked men equipped for rapid marching, he hastened forward, clearing the way for the main body of the army, which was to follow more slowly, starting a fortnight after his own departure with the footmen in the advance party were the four friars of the expedition, whose zealous eagerness to reach the un the unconverted natives. <laughs> so you're looking for the unconverted. That means you have not bent the knee to Baal, right? To Zeus, right? To Jupiter, Khan. To Jesus, Khan. To Yahweh, Khan. Hijack free. So they're looking for the unconverted natives of the seven cities. So they knew these people were, <laughs> were righteous. They weren't part of their program, their doctrine. They're savages, right? <laughs> but they're in the seven cities of gold, but they're savages. Does that make some sense to you? Does that make any sense to you? How can you be a savage in the seven cities of gold? Cities of gold. Savages. They're looking for the unconverted natives of the seven cities. And they had zealous eagerness to reach you. And it was so great that they were willing to leave the main portion of the army without a spiritual guide. Fortunately for these followers, a broken leg compelled one of the brethren to remain behind. Coronado attempted to take some sheep with him, but these soon proved to be so great a hindrance that they were left at the river of Yaquimi in charge of four horsemen who, who conducted them to a more moderate pace. Leaving Culiacan on April 22nd, Coronado followed the coast, bearing off to the left as Mota Padilla says by an extremely rough way to the river Sinaloa. The configuration 
of the country made it necessary to follow up the valley of this stream until he could find a passage across the mountains to the course of Yaquimi. He traveled alongside this stream for some distance and then crossed the Sonora River. The Sonora was followed nearly to its source before a pass was discovered. On the northern side of the mountains, he found a stream, the next pa, N-E-X-P-A, he calls it. Which may have been either the Santa Cruz or the San Pedro of modern maps, the party followed down the river valley until they reached the edge of the wilderness where Friar Marcos had described it to them. They found Kikit Kikitalikali. Here the party camped for two days, which was so which was as long as the general dared to, to delay. In order to rest the horses, he had begun to give out some time before as a result of overloading rough roads and poor fed. The stock of provisions brought from Culiacan was already growing dangerously small, although the food supply had been eked out by the large cones or nuts of the pines of this country, which the soldiers found to be very good eating. The Indians who had come to see him told Coronado that the sea was ten days distant. And he expressed surprise, which Mr. Bandelier has re-echoed that Friar Marcos could have gone without sight of the sea from this part of the country. Coronado entered the wilderness, the white mountain Apache country of Arizona on St. Saint John's Eve. St. John's Eve. And in the quaint language of Ha or Hawk Luke's transition of the general's translation of the general's letter, quote, to fresh our former travails. The first days we found no grass, no worse way of mountains and bad passages. Coronado followed very nearly the line of the present road from Fort Apache to Gila River, proceeded until he came within sight of the first of the seven cities. Uh oh. Uh oh, they think they're finding some drop. He came within sight of the first of the seven cities. The first few days of the march were very trying. The discouragement of the men increased with the difficulties of the way. The horses were tired and the slow progress became slower as horses and Indian carriers fell down and died. The corn was almost gone and as a result of eating the fruits and herbs which they had found along the way, a Spaniard and some of his servants were poisoned so badly that they died. They don't even know what they're doing, they're just eating stuff. The skulls and horns of a great mountain goat which were lying on the ground filled the Europeans with wonder. <laughs> But this was hardly a sight to inspire them with hopes of abundant food and gold. They're, they're really looking for the cities of gold. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like as mythological as it is to you, and we talk about it, and we see it in cartoons, they're really looking for it. They're, they believe it so much that they're putting their lives and people are dying in the middle of wherever to find Cities of gold, my nagi, right here where the savages are. Who are you, my nagi, that you would have cities of gold all around you? You need to really meditate on this. Who's the Preston? They were 30 leagues of this traveling, traveling before the party reached the borders of the inhabited country where they found fresh grass, many nut and mulberry trees. The following day, that on which they left the wilderness, the advanced guard was met in a peace, peaceable manner by four Indians. The Spaniards treated them most kindly, gave them beads and clothing, 
and willed them to return unto their city and bid them stay quiet in their houses, fearing nothing. Oh, don't do nothing. We we just passing through, boss. Yeah, they pass. They they passing through, but they about to bring everybody, right? So it's like seeing them little scout ants. You're like, man, this ant trying to scout around. Yeah, I. Right. <laughs> he gonna come back with the whole squid eye, right? So this is, you know, these are the parasites entering their country. <laughs> He's at the borders of an inn. Habited country, they found the fresh grass, nuts, mulberry trees. They were greeted in a peaceable manner by four Nagas. The Spaniards treated them well, right? Gave them all kind of trinkets. The general assured them that they need have no anxiety because the newcomers had been sent by his Spanish majesty to defend and aid them. Ain't that what they tell us today? Oh, we're just coming... Uh, to aid you, to to bring you peace, to bring you a surety. Trust us. Vote for us. Vote for this president, that president, this governor, that governor, this senate. We have your interest in mind. We're here to aid you. The same witchcraft, man. The same forked tongue. Let's get this for the dismount. The provisions from Culiacan or co or collected along the way were now exhausted, and as a sudden attack by the Indians during the last night before their arrival at the cities had assured the Spanish Spaniards of a hostile reception, it was necessary to proceed rapidly. The inhabitants of the first city and had assembled in a great crowd at some distance in front of the place awaiting the approach of the strangers while the army advanced Garcia Lopez de Cardenas who had been appointed to Santiago's position as field master and Hernando Vermizo appear, apparently one of the good fellows whose name <laughs> Casanata forgot rode forward and summoned the Indians to surrender in approved Castilian fashion, as his majesty commanded always to be done. The natives had drawn some lines on the ground, doubtless similar to those which they still mark with sacred metal in their ceremonial dramatizations, and across these they refused to let the Spaniards pass, answering the summons with showers of arrows. <laughs> they said, come on, bruh. Come on, bruh. Cross this line. That's it. These ain't no turn the other chick nagas right here. <laughs> they stand in the ground. The soldiers beg for the command to attack. But Coronado restrained them as long as he could. When the influence of the friars was added to the pleas of the men. Perhaps without waiting for the command of permission the whole company uttered the santiago the sacred war cry of saint james against the infidels and rushed upon the crowd of indians who turned and fled coronado quickly recalled his men from the pursuit and ordered them to prepare for an assault on the city the force was divided into attacking parties which immediately advanced against the walls from all sides the crossbow men and hark bruisers Arc Bruziers, who were expected to drive the army, drive the enemy back from the tops of the walls, were unable to accomplish anything on account of their physical weakness and of accidents to their weapons. The natives showered arrows against the advancing foes, and as the Spaniards approached the walls, stones of all sizes were thrown upon them with skillful aim and practice strength. The general in his glittering armor was the especial target of the defenders and twice he was knocked to the ground by heavy rocks. His good headpiece and the devotion of his companions saved him from serious injury. Although his bruises confined him to the camp for several days, the courage and 
military skill of the white men, weak, weak and tired as they were, proved too much for the Indians who were deserted, who deserted their homes after a fierce but not protracted resistance. Most of the Spaniards had received many hard knocks, <laughs> and Agonias, Suarez, possibly another of the gentlemen forgotten by Casanada, was severely wounded by arrows, as were also three foot soldiers. The Indians had been driven from the main portion of the town, and with this success, the Spaniards were satisfied. Food, quote, that which we needed a great deal more than gold and silver, writes one member of the victorious force, was found in the rooms already secure. The Spaniards fortified themselves, stationed guards, and rested. During the night, the Indians who had retired to the wings of the main building after the conflict packed up what goods they could and left the Spaniards in undis undisputed possession of the whole place. The mystery of the seven cities was revealed at last. The Spanish con conquerors had reached their goal. July 7, 1540, white men for the first time entered one of the communal communal villages of stone and mud inhabited by the Zuni Indians of New Mexico. Granada was the name which the Spaniards gave to the first village, the Indian Hawiku or Hawaku, in honor of the viceroy to whose birthplace they say it bore a fancy resemblance. Here they found besides plenty of corn, beans, and fowls better than those of New Spain, and sought the best and whitest I have seen in all my life, writes one of those who had helped to win the town. But even the abundance of food could not wholly satisfy the men whose toilsome march of more than four months had been lightened by dreams of golden, a golden haven. Friar Marcos was there to see the realization of the visions which the zealous sermons of his brethren and the prolific ardor of rumor and of common talk had raised from his truthful report. So they're in the city of gold, but they can't really see it. They're not in that frequency. They're not in the frequency. They just see uh, mud huts and they don't see the city. They got to be in the cold. They got to be in the frequency. One does not wonder that he eagerly accepted the earliest opportunity of returning to New Spain to escape from the not merely muttered complaints and upbraidings in expressing which the general was chief. The Spaniards at Zuni some of the inhabitants of Hawaku, Granada, returned to the village bringing gifts while Coronado was recovering from his wounds. The general faithfully exhorted them to become Christians and to submit themselves to the sovereign overlordship of his majesty, the Spanish king. The interview failed to reassure the natives, for they packed all the provisions improperly on the following day and with their wives and children abandoned the villages in the valley and withdrew to their stronghold. The secure fastness on top of the Ter Yalon, T-A-A-I-Y-A-L-O-N-E, Ter Yalon, or the Thunder Mountain. Uh-oh. <laughs> they went up to the Thunder Mountain. And as soon as he was able, Coronado visited the other villages of the Cibola Zuni, observing the country carefully. We'll pick it up right here next time. Exploring, exploration, or invasion of our country, of our land. This is a journey of Coronado, 1540 to 1542, translated and edited by George Parker Winship, and I appreciate all my noggins for surfing the wave and getting our story and getting the babies out the bathwater and putting us back together again. And if they're doing all this 
for you, for your land. You're hearing about the California gold rush and all this other, you know, they're looking for the cities of gold. If they already had it elsewhere, they wouldn't be here. If it was elsewhere, they wouldn't be here. They're looking for the founder of youth. If it was elsewhere, they wouldn't be here. We might have to get back on that ZZYZX love to Aqua Gina. Dig on the founder of youth, man. We are just enjoying the clarity of this journey of Coronado and hey, how to the real ones for your contribution. Dragons on the wall, Tawata. Shall I go to the tribe? Keep the water flowing. Yeah, man.